I imagine in my mind's eye that that is a small picture of what worship in heaven might be, a multitude of voices in harmony and how beautiful that will be and how beautiful that was. Thank you. Uh, Well, would you stand please as we uh, turn to the word of God in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of God. Let's pray. How wonderful. God, how amazing, how beautiful, how freeing, how hopeful these verses are in Scripture that make so plain that you set your love on a people and called us to yourself. And not because of anything in us or any works we could do to earn your love or favor or salvation, but you giving it freely, the gift of grace, the gift of faith to open our eyes to see and believe Uh, that which you've called us to, the beauty and glory of the gospel found in Jesus Christ, the forgiver of our sins. Um, We give you thanks for this. We we now pray for uh, Pastor Trent and this message that we will hear, God, that the Holy Spirit would open uh, our eyes and our hearts to receive it and and, and have grace anew and deeper and that we might uh, might fathom in a more... uh, deep way, your love that you have bestowed upon us with this free grace, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. You may be seated. Many of you were here back in 2017 when Hurricane Irma came to visit our community. As the hurricane was moving closer, it became apparent that it was going to be a dramatic wind event, and there was a lot of thinking that it was also going to be a significant water event, and praise God, the water piece missed us, but the wind was significant. And as the hurricane got closer, People who are sensible went to the stores and bought everything off the shelves, (laughs) anticipating disaster, because that's the appropriate way to prepare. Other people who like to play it nonchalant as storms approach didn't do that, and I was in that latter category. (laughs) And as the storm, as it became clear, about 24 hours from when the storm was supposed to make landfall... While I had confidence that our house would do fine in the face of storm surge, I had less confidence that our non-hurricane-proof windows would hold up well when a coconut came blowing through at 150 miles an hour. And uh, after watching some YouTube videos about what happens to your house if your windows go out in a hurricane, I thought, I better go get some plywood. So I went to Home Depot at, you know, within 24 hours of when the hurricane was supposed to get here. (laughs) And uh, you know what I found there, right? (laughs) Nothing. There wasn't a scrap of wood to be found anywhere in that store because everybody had already bought it all. And so I'm frantically running around Home Depot and Lowe's trying to find any piece of lumber as the people working in the store just shaking their heads like, you idiot, how did you not know what was coming? But eventually one of the store Uh, clerks pointed me to some prefabricated fencing that, you know, these six foot 
blocks of uh, fence that had been pre-assembled. And um, for an arm and a leg, I was able to purchase that fencing, three of them. And if I could have purchased more, I would have, despite what it cost me, because I knew what kind of peril we were in. So I bought these pieces of fencing and, um, and a friend from the church had some lumber in their yard. I see you up there. And another friend had uh, some Tapcon screws that, of course, one could also not find in any hardware store. And they helped me get my house prepared for the storm that was, that was coming on us. And we made it through fine. But you know, what's interesting about this is, you know, I've been to those stores many times and I never, never paid one bit of attention to plywood. <laughs> it meant absolutely nothing to me. I don't build things. I can't build things. I don't pay attention to plywood. Don't care. It wasn't until I knew the danger that I was in that suddenly plywood became to me and to everybody else the most valuable thing I could find. And I searched everywhere. I would have paid whatever it took to get the protection that that plywood offered to my house. In a similar way, as we read through these verses, we pass over those words, grace, faith, you have been saved. And, and you may just go over those words like I used to go past plywood at the hardware store. It means nothing to me. Because you've yet to appreciate the kind of danger, the kind of peril that the Bible says you are in. But when you understand the great danger that the scripture says is coming upon the world, namely a storm of God's wrath that is coming upon rebellious humanity because this universe, there must be justice. So God must bring wrath. We know this, there's a lot of wrong that needs to be made right. And what the Bible says is we're all on the wrong side of that storm of justice that's coming. And when you realize that you're on the wrong side of the storm that's coming, you too will begin looking everywhere for protection, for some kind of rescue, for some kind of way through. And then you come across these words, grace, faith, you have been saved. And suddenly you can't see those words the same way. Either these words will mean everything to you because you understand what you have been saved from, or they won't mean anything to you, just like plywood meant nothing to me before. Last week, we saw the Apostle Paul said that we were all in a desperate condition, beyond desperate. He said we were dead, spiritually dead, unresponsive, unable to do anything to help yourself, hopeless, nothing you could do. And into the midst of that deadness where you're simply carried along by the the, the passions of your own flesh and the, the pressures that work around you in the world and culture in which you live and, and even by the spiritual forces of evil in this world. In the midst of your deadness, God entered in and made you alive and he raised you up with Christ as surely as Christ was raised from the dead. And he seated you with Christ at his right hand, a position of authority over everything in this universe so that in the present and in the coming ages, he might pour out upon you day after day from his immeasurable riches of grace and kindness to you in Christ Jesus. That's what he's done for you. And in this passage, he begins to get into some of the theological explanation of how you have experienced this salvation if in fact you have experienced it. So this is how we might sum up what the Apostle Paul is gonna show us as we make our way through the passage. Salvation is a gift of God's grace received with the empty hands of faith, which results in a life devoted to doing good. So we're gonna explore this theme under the heading of three questions. How are we saved? And who really saves us? What's our part in that? And finally, for what purpose are we saved? So let's start at the beginning. How are we saved? Paul begins by making it very clear. And here it's actually filling out something he already referenced earlier in the passage. 
But now he fills it out and gives it a little more meat around the bones. He says in verse eight, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. The first thing we have to understand is that the salvation we have received, if we have received it, is by grace. What exactly is grace? That's one of those theological words that sometimes we Uh, It's said so frequently, it's lost its meaning. Or you have a friend named Grace and your dog's named Grace and you've got, you know, Grace is just like, it's just another religious word and you don't really think about what it means. What actually is grace? Grace is undeserved favor. It is a gift that someone gives to you, which then by definition is not something that's deserved, it's something that someone chooses freely, voluntarily, to give you. But it's different than a gift in that we give gifts to people that we love. This goes beyond that. This is the giving of a gift to somebody who actually deserves the exact opposite. Grace is when you sin against your spouse and what you deserve is a happy meal with no toy in it. (laughs) And they make you a nice dinner with a good heart and serve you. That's grace. It's not what you deserve. They choose to give it to you. Anytime we receive forgiveness, that's that's grace. That's somebody giving us what we we deserve is judgment. We deserve is to pay what we owe. But but forgiveness is giving somebody what they don't deserve. He says that salvation is something God gives when what we deserve is the opposite. Judgment, condemnation, condemnation. The wrath of God, it's a gift. So he says, it's by grace. Then he goes on and says, you have been saved. The the construction of this phrase in Greek suggests a, a completed action that continues to have results into the present. You have been saved and you continue to enjoy the benefits of this salvation. But But what exactly have we been saved from? It's all great to tell somebody you've been saved, but they might just look at you puzzled because they didn't realize they were in any danger. What have you been saved from? Well, that's what I was referring to earlier on in this message. If you have been saved, in the biblical sense of the word, you have been saved from the wrath of God that is coming on the world to bring justice, to make what is wrong right. And you, as one on the wrong side of justice who deserves wrath, you've been saved from wrath because God gave his son Jesus to bear the wrath you deserved in your place. He was an appropriate, willing substitute. And now there's no wrath for you. You've been saved from it. But if you are a Christian, as we're defining it here through these sermons, if you're a Christian, you are somebody who has also been saved from your slavery to sin. Not that sin isn't still active in your life and it's not something you have to fight and resist, but but you're no longer a slave to it. You actually have the power to resist the evil that's at work in the world and even inside of you. It's not your master anymore. If you are a Christian, you have also been saved from the hopelessness and despair which must characterize your life if you believe this is all there is. You have been saved from spiritual death, brought to life, and one day we'll be saved from physical death when Jesus returns to raise his people from the dead. By grace, as a gift, you have been saved from all of this if you have received God's gift of salvation. Well, how exactly does a person receive that gift that God gives freely to people who, by definition, don't deserve it? And he tells us, again, verse eight, through faith. Faith is the instrument by which we receive the gift God gives freely. Francis Shaver used to say that that faith is like empty hands. We hold out into which God places this gift of salvation. It's important to understand that it is not faith that saves you. Faith is only as good as its object. Faith is, you you trusting is only as good as what you are trusting in. And so the Bible very specifically says that it's not faith generally that saves you. It's not faith in God or faith in faith or faith in the universe working out. It is specifically 
faith in Jesus and what he did during his earthly ministry here described in this book, his life, his death, his resurrection, it's faith in him that saves you from this wrath and judgment which is coming on the world. John Calvin says about faith, he says, when on the part of man, the act of receiving salvation is made to consist in faith alone, all other means on which men are accustomed to rely are discarded. Here's the point. Faith then brings a man empty to God that he may be filled with the blessings of Christ. That's faith. We come empty to God that we may be filled with the blessings of Christ. This is the way by which this free gift of salvation is given and by which we receive it. But this creates some problems. And you might wonder, like intellectually, there's some problems here. It's like, why, how is it that just by believing something, I can escape the punishment that I deserve for what I've done with my hands and my mind? How does that actually work? That doesn't make sense. I was talking with somebody this week who raised the very, good, the very good point. They said, why is it, this doesn't seem right, it doesn't seem fair, that you could have a person who lives a terrible life, miserable person, awful to everybody, and says, well, I trust in Jesus as my savior, and they are saved from the wrath of God that's coming on the world when the basically good and moral person who tries to do good to people and live their life on the right track but doesn't trust in Jesus is somehow going to face God's wrath and judgment. That doesn't make any sense. It's not fair. And they're, they're, actually, they're actually exactly right. It's not fair. Grace is not fair. By definition, grace is not fair. If you want fair, there, there are lots of religions that will give you what you deserve. Christianity is not one of them. It's not fair. People who deserve condemnation and judgment receive grace and mercy and forgiveness. And people who live their lives so as to deserve forgiveness and mercy are left out in the cold. It's not fair. It's, frankly, offensive. The fact that salvation is by grace alone means by definition that the people who receive it do not deserve it. And the people who think they deserve it will never receive it because it only comes by grace it's only to the undeserving. For a person to trust in Jesus, what we're talking about when we talk about this faith, receiving salvation by faith, it means, first of all, that a person has come to the conclusion that the wrath of God's judgment really is coming on the world and that they deserve it. It means, secondly, that they understand and believe that there is nothing they can do to save themselves from the judgment that is rightly coming on the world. It means thirdly that they believe that Jesus Christ was provided as the substitute who took the wrath their sins deserve so that they could be forgiven and they, they believe that's who he is. And it means fourthly that they've put all their chips on Jesus, that he's done it all. They're not holding out any hope in themselves. They're not putting any trust in themselves, any part of their own record. It's all in on Jesus. The person who has done that, regardless of anything else, the Bible says, you have been saved. Everyone else is in the other category regardless of what they've done. It's not fair. It's grace. He gives it freely. And here's the thing. To actually believe those things is already the effect of God's grace in a person's life. The spiritually dead person has no awareness that God's wrath is coming on them. 
The spiritually dead person has no awareness of what Jesus has done for them. The spiritually dead person does not cast themselves on Jesus' mercy. You see, even this act of faith is a result of God's grace at work in the life of who? The undeserving. Because that's the only kind of people there are. Which brings us to the second piece. Who then saves us? Who actually saves us? Is salvation God's work? Is it our work? Or is it some combination of God and us working together to save us? Well, Paul helps dispel any false notions we might have in verses 8 and 9. This is what he writes. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. This is not your own doing. The question is, what is this? What is this referred to? In our English Bibles, when we read this, we would connect that relative pronoun, this, with the noun that precedes it. Most obviously, the word faith. This faith is not your own doing. And some people interpret it that way. However, the Greek language here is helpful, which was the language this was written in. And when we look at this in Greek, what you discover is that it's almost impossible that he's talking about faith here, at least not exclusively. Because in Greek, nouns and pronouns have gender, masculine, feminine, neuter. And pronouns and nouns need to agree in their gender in order to be referring to each other. And so the word this is neuter. The word faith is feminine, which means that's not the primary referent of that pronoun. So we go back further and we say, well, maybe he's talking about grace. No luck. Grace also is feminine. So what is he talking about when he says, this is not of yourselves? He's not talking about faith. He's not talking about grace. Almost certainly what he's talking about is the whole of this salvation, including the grace and the faith. None of this is your own doing. All of this salvation from the beginning to the end, all of this is not your own doing. It is all the gift of God for the undeserving. And if it's not clear enough, he makes it even more clear when he says in verse 9, not a result of works. So this is not a partnership between you and God, this salvation project. This is God's doing. It's all his gift. It's not a result of your works of any kind. Works of the law, works of righteousness, no works. Nothing you do is contributing to this work of salvation. The answer to the question, who saves us, is God saves us. God saves sinners. It's not a result of works. It's the gift of God. If you're given something, you did not earn it. If you earned something, you are not given it. Salvation is something that is given, not earned. There are a lot of you here today who have probably earned a college degree, maybe graduate degree as well. And, uh, you know, suppose you tell me you, you earned your degree, and I say to you, oh, that was really nice of the university to give you that degree. What a, what a great gift. And you say, no, you misunderstand. Uh, you know, I spent four years at school. I worked hard. I, I had work study. I, I, I studied. I made sacrifices. It cost me a fortune. I earned that degree. It was not a gift. You'd be absolutely right. You did earn it, Right? And because you earned it, it's not a gift. You worked for it. You deserved it. You paid for it. Salvation is not like that. When we think about salvation, we're not talking about something that you deserve. We're not talking about something that you're worthy of. We're not talking about something you paid for. We're not talking about something that you had anything to do with whatsoever. Salvation is more like an inheritance. But what happens in an inheritance? In an inheritance, somebody who worked really hard for something gives it to you for free just because you're related to them.
Now, there are some families who wisely, I think, condition the giving of an inheritance on working in the family business, and you know, you have to earn it at some measure, but that's not the kind of inheritance I'm talking about. Inheritance in the truest form of the word is your parent or your grandparent worked hard, they made sacrifices, they made tough decisions, they accumulated, they saved, and they prepared something that they then, at the end of their life or towards the end of it, hand over to you for no other reason than that they love you. It's a gift. What's more ridiculous than an heir parading themselves around like they did something to deserve the fortune they've been given? It's ridiculous to walk around with pride like I did something. You didn't do something. Except you just were born related to somebody who did something. And you know, most heirs that I know, that's, they don't carry themselves like they did something. They carry themselves like they received amazing gift. They're proud of the work their parents or grandparents did. Then they pass this on and they feel themselves stewards to share with and to use for good what they've been given freely because they recognize they didn't do anything to deserve it. It was simply given to them. Salvation is like an inheritance. Jesus worked for it. Jesus paid for it. Jesus earned it. And he gives it freely to you for no other reason than that you were joined to him. Why is it so important that we understand that salvation is not a result of our works? It's not a payment we get for anything we do or done or will do. Paul tells us in verse 9, so that no one may boast. If you, if you got your degree, associate's degree, four-year degree, your high school diploma, you have a right to boast. You did something. You shouldn't boast because it doesn't look good, but you did something. And you could boast. Paul says, you see, salvation's not like that. You can't boast in it. There's nothing you did. You're like the air. The air can't boast except in what somebody else did for them. So salvation is like that. Salvation is a gift. When we've properly understood it, we understand there is not one ounce of pride, not one grain of contribution that I can say, I did that. And instead, all glory goes to God. It's him who saves. It is we who are the recipients of his gracious salvation. How will we know when we've really understood that salvation is all of grace, it's all a gift that he gives and in which we can't boast? If we find ourselves looking down on sinful people, it's because we don't yet understand that our salvation is entirely of grace. It's an indication that we think we did something to deserve what we've received. That we think we maybe got grace because we turned away from our sin. That's not why you received grace. You turned away from your sin because you received his grace. If we find ourselves offended by commercials that depict Jesus showing love to unlovable people, it might be because we think we did something to be lovable that they're not doing and need to do if they're to receive love. You know, there's been this ongoing talk for a number of years now about college loan forgiveness. And I don't know if we've actually forgiven anybody's loans or not. It's like it's on, it's off, it happened, it didn't happen. I don't know. But who does college loan forgiveness tick off the most? <laughs> you can raise your hand, I, I know. It, it, I'll tell you it ticks off the most. It ticks off the people like me and like you who had to take college loans and then scrounged and ate ramen noodle every day for years to pay off my student loans. And my wife had to work to help pay off my student loans. That's who it ticks off. It ticks off the people who did something to deserve being debt-free. 
Who does salvation by grace alone tick off the most? Moral people, righteous people, religious people, people who think they did something to deserve what they've received and who are incredibly bothered at the idea that God would just give this freely to somebody who doesn't deserve it. Does God's grace offend you? The fact that God loves people and extends grace to people who are 100% undeserving, does that cause your heart to soar with joy? Or do you find yourself a little bit upset that they get to share in the same gift that you share in? We will know we understand salvation by grace when we rejoice at the idea that God loves to shower his grace upon sinners. When we see adulterers and drunkards and sexual sinners of every stripe and thieves welcomed, loved, brought in, we'll rejoice because we know we weren't any ounce more worthy or deserving than they. And we'll make room for them. We'll invite them. We'll actually want them to be around because we know that's precisely the kind of people that God loves to target with his undeserved gifts. Because that's precisely the kind of person I am. For what purpose then? Does God do this salvation? For what purpose are we saved? He says in verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. For we are his workmanship. You can't be saved by your good works because you're actually his good work that he saved so that you would do good works. You're his workmanship. The Greek word here is poema. It's the word for which we get our word poem. That's why Bill uses that as his slogan for the creative arts ministry. It's like you're God's handiwork. You're his masterpiece that he has saved and is remaking to be a doer of good works. As a reflection of his goodness and his glory. Look, we are not saved by our good works, but we are saved for good works. Good works do not result in salvation. Good works are the result of salvation. You absolutely have to get this order right. Because even now, after having preached to you for as long as I've preached to you, and maybe you've been hearing preaching this for years, if you were to ask the average person in a church congregation or out on the street, Why should God let you into heaven? Their answer will be something like, because I'm basically good. Because I do more good than bad. Because I'm generous. Because I care about people. Because I do my best. All of that is works. And none of that is the basis upon which you will ever enter into heaven. Your good works can't save you because in fact, you actually can't do any. Look, even the works that you do, he says in verse 10, are what God prepared beforehand so that you, who were created new in Christ Jesus, can walk in them. They are what you do after you're saved, not to get saved. So what is these good what are these good works that we're supposed to, to be doing if we've been saved? What actually is a good work? Well, let me share with you how it's let me paraphrase for you what one of our confessional documents says about it. This is how it defines a good work. It says, a good work is something commanded in God's word, coming from a heart purified by faith and done for the glory of God. It's commanded by God's word. It comes from a heart that's been purified by faith and it's done for the aim of God's glory. What that means is, until you have been saved, you can't do a good work. 
Now, to those of you who are not Christians here today, I'm not saying you can't do good. You do good. You're, you're generous. You're kind of people. You do. Those are good things. They're relatively good things. But in terms of God's standard and what he defines as good, one cannot do any good until you have received the free gift of salvation. So the point is, your good works can never get you there because they're not good. And in his sight, until you have experienced this transformation. And now, being motivated by a desire to obey his word, and with a heart purified by faith, having received this gift of salvation, and with the only aim being that God be glorified through your work, now you could properly do what God says is good. And what are those good things? But we can't do any better than to say to do good is to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. That is good. It's good for you to be self-controlled and sober-minded. It's to do good to forgive those who've hurt you, to pray for those who persecute you and bless them, and to pray for leaders and all those in high position. It's good for you to use your words to build others up and not to use your words to slander and gossip and tear people apart. It's good for you to do your work with diligence as though working for God and not for man, whatever your work is. It's good for you to share the gospel with friends and neighbors and people in your life. It's good for you to raise your children in the discipline of the Lord and to teach them about Jesus. It's good for you to be a part of planting churches in the community and beyond. It's good for you to be generous with what God has given you. It's good for you to seek justice and to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. It's good for you to show hospitality, especially to people who can't return the favor. It's good for you to uphold the sanctity of marriage and the vows that you've made. It's good for you to give thanks in all circumstances, to rejoice. All of these things are good works. Do you see? These aren't some like special extra things that we have to add on to our daily life. This is the way in which you live as a person who has been saved by grace. You just go about your normal life doing good. The things that God describes in his word is good. From a heart purified by faith for the glory of God. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is why he saved you. That you would be a picture to the world of what life can look like and what it should look like with Jesus as king. Here's the thing though. After you've been walking with Jesus for a while and you, you become less and less impressed with your own good works. If you, see them, if you see them right, if you're actually growing in grace, you're less and less impressed with yourself because here's what you discover. As much as you want to do what's good, we frequently don't. And even when we do what's good, we frequently don't do it for the right reason. And even when we do do it for the right reason, for God's glory, there's oftentimes a lot of self mixed in there. I'm doing it for God's glory, but I appreciate the fact that people pat me on the back and think I'm something special, right? You realize it's like just in there. You just can't get it out. You just can't make it go away. And so you might get discouraged and say, you know, what's the use? Why even try to do good? If, I, if, I, if, it's not, if even my best good works are not good, what's, what's the use? And, and this is true. Even our best word, this is how the, the confession tells it. This is the encouragement we get from that same document. It says, the persons of believers being accepted through Christ, their good works are also accepted in Christ, not as though they were in this life wholly unblameable and unreprovable in God's sight, but that God looking upon them in his son is pleased to accept and reward that which is sincere, although accompanied with many weaknesses and imperfections. In other words, your good works are gonna to continue to be mixed with bad to the end, sorry. But here's the good news. He accepts them and delights in them because he is accepted and delighted in you, in Jesus. So like a father or mother who gladly receives the deformed piece of art their child lovingly gives them, and thinks it's amazing and celebrates it and praises it, though, you know, it's messed up. <laughs> so God receives your sincere efforts 
to respond to his grace by doing good, imperfect as it will be, he delights in it. And you can delight in giving it, knowing that he loves you and receives it from you. That's grace. It's grace that saves you. It's grace that's changing you. It's grace that allows even now the good works you're doing on the other side of salvation to even be acceptable in his sight. This salvation is all of his grace. And the more you press into this and, and, and meditate upon this, the more it will change you. That nothing you have from him is earned or deserved. Everything you have has been given to you freely. That kind of grace changes us. It's no secret that I love Les Mes and I can't talk about grace without talking about this story. And by the way, next Sunday night, if you don't have your tickets, Jean Valjean is going to be here. <laughs> Sunday night at 6.30. Jean Valjean played Broadway, played London's West End, played Jean Valjean for 3,000 some shows. He's gonna be here singing not only some of those songs, but also other Broadway songs. You may have friends who would never step foot in this church, but they love Broadway. It's a great thing to invite them to. Because in the course of that evening, I'm gonna share a few thoughts. I'm not gonna preach the old gospel to them. I'm just gonna share a few thoughts, building a bridge between Broadway and the good news of the gospel that may just give you the opportunity to have a follow-up conversation to tell them the good news about Jesus. So if you don't have your tickets, invite your Broadway friends, buy their ticket for them, and join us next Sunday night for that. Back to Valjean. In the story of Les Mes, Jean Valjean is this character who's just spent 19 years in prison, essentially in slavery, for stealing a loaf of bread to feed his starving nephew and then trying to escape from prison a number of times along the way. And after he's released from prison, he's a hardened man. He's angry because of what he's experienced, because of the injustice that's been done to him in his life. And as he makes his way out, he tries to find work. He tries to be respectable and responsible. And, and everywhere he goes, nobody will hire him. Nobody will give him work because he has to present this paper that demonstrates that he's a convict. They won't hire him. And the ones who do hire him won't pay him rightly because of that. So then he tries to find lodging and nobody will take him in. The innkeeper kicks him out. Word passes around town. Everybody knows he's coming and they say, you, we won't have you here because we are law-abiding people. You don't belong with us. And so in despair, he makes his way to a doorway where he lays down in the cold to sleep. And he even tries to find refuge in a doghouse and the dog chases him out. He's just like condemned, not wanted. And he lays down in a doorway and this woman comes by and says, why haven't you got yourself a place to sleep? He says, nobody will take me in. She says, have you tried all the doors in town? He said, he tries all the doors. She said, did you try that door? He said, I haven't tried that door. And that door is the door of the bishop. And he goes over to that door and he knocks and the bishop welcomes in the one that everyone else has rejected. He brings him into his home. He calls him brother. He gives him dignity. He showers him with love, with grace, with, with blessing. He gives him his first hot meal he's had in 19 years. He prepares a bed for him, for a man who hasn't slept on a mattress in 19 years. He treats him with love and respect and kindness. He can't believe it. He wakes up in the middle of the night and his baser instincts take hold. He saw where the bishop kept the little bit of silver, silverware that he had, and he steals it, and he takes off running with the silver. Well, the next morning, as the bishop and his attendants are eating breakfast, in comes Valjean being drugged by a couple of policemen. Valjean's face has fallen. He's a condemned man. He knows that what he deserves for mistreating this man, for abusing his grace, for, for, for doing what he did is to go back to prison for the rest of his life. He's condemned. And when the bishop sees him, he doesn't give him what he deserves. He says, ah, oh, there you are. You left without taking the best pieces. The candlesticks. These are surely worth several hundred francs. And he gives him the candlesticks and the police are just flabbergasted and Valjean is even more so. He cannot believe what's just happened. And as the priest gives him the candlesticks, he says, remember that you've promised me you will take these and become an honest man. 
And so the rest of the story goes that Valjean, having been changed by this act of grace that he did not deserve, begins to try to build an honest life. He did not receive those candlesticks because he was deserving. He received those candlesticks in the midst of his most undeserving moment and it changed him. And he began to live a life doing good because he was changed by grace. Grace is not something that comes to us because we got our act together. It comes to us when we're in our deepest mess. In the world, grace goes to deserving people. Bad people get canceled. In God's economy, the least deserving receive the most, while those who are full go away empty. How will you know if you've received this grace? Here's how you'll know. You'll increasingly become a person that is amazed that you should belong to God, that you were chosen to be a guest at his table. You will increasingly look at people that the world despises, and you'll see them as people in need of compassion and love. You'll be like that heir who's been given a tremendous gift, who doesn't walk around with a spirit of pridefulness looking down on everybody and pointing the finger everywhere, but saying, with how much I've been given, who can I share this with in order to bless them and help them in the midst of their misery? How can I come alongside them and share this bread I've been given freely when I see they're so hungry and so in need? This is the gospel. It's not fair. But grace is free. And if you're here today and you say, I'm, I'm, I believe it's probably free for some people, but it couldn't be for me. I know what I'm like. I know things nobody should know. I'm, I'm not deserving. I just want to assure you, you are precisely the person God loves to shower with his grace. The least you think you deserve it, the more likely you are to receive it. So receive it today. <laughs> Don't try to earn it. Just say, thank you. Thank you for the gift you've given me in Jesus. And let that grace begin to change you. It will. Surely it will. As surely as it did Valjean. And if you've received that grace and you're freshly reminded of it today, stand firm in it. Don't go back to thinking that any of this is based on who you are or what you've done. Stand firm in that grace and then go out and find the least deserving person you can and extend that grace to them as well. Let's pray. Lord, we're all just beggars here. None of us has a bit of righteousness of our own to hold up before you and say, we're worthy of this amazing gift. Every one of us here is unworthy, and we thank you that it's precisely for this reason that Jesus came. For those who feel least worthy today, I pray that they will feel most loved, most astounded by this gift you give freely, that they'll receive it, and that they'll rise and walk in the newness of life that grace brings to the dead. And for us who have received it, Lord, may we grow increasingly humble as we increasingly become aware of just how undeserving we are, were, and yet just how amazingly we have been loved, and that that same love would characterize us in all of our relationships with those outside. We pray this not for our glory, but that you alone would receive all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.